This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, good morning, afternoon, or evening. Whatever time you're watching us, we are just thrilled you tuned in for another edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Another 30 minutes of all the agribusiness news that you can handle is on the way. Coming up, can milk and other dairy products prevent Alzheimer's? We'll be joined by a nutritionist that says, yes, it can. And she's got some things you can do in hopes of lowering your risk. Also on the program, Mark Waldman on why this popular farm market in Macon County is extending their season. And then later. Hey everybody, Ranger Nick coming up. If you got plans to do some camping, and that camping involves maybe building a campfire, I'm gonna tell you how tremendously of a bad idea it is to move that firewood, and it involves the beautiful ash tree. All that and so much more starts right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Ask any cattle or dairyman and they'll tell you the welfare of their animals is priority number one. That's why having a reliable and trusted large animal veterinarian to care for their herd is so important. Damon Jones takes a look at one vet who started her company to help the underserved community. They say a healthy cow is a happy cow. And that's really the case for all farm animals, which is why having a large animal vet close by is so important for productivity. It was a void Shanda Thompson saw in Lamar County a couple of years back when she decided to start up her own practice. Just kind of took a good leap of faith, saw that there was a need for um, a large animal veterinarian in our area. I always really liked ambulatory work and so decided to start this mixed animal practice. That's kind of how it evolved just we, over the last decade we've probably had a large number of veterinarians either retire or um, move to strictly small animal and so uh, it kind of left our area um, starving for a large animal veterinarian. And so far, so good, as Thompson Veterinary Services rolls all throughout Lamar and the surrounding counties, providing assistance that is very much appreciated by the customers. With the shortage in our area of large animal veterinarians, um, people are so grateful to be able to get in touch with somebody that will actually come out on the farm and, and help them out. However, with that kind of 24-7 accessibility comes a very unpredictable work schedule. Some days I may get off at 7 in the evening, some days it may not be until 11 or 12 at night. Um, so my hours are crazy and I really don't have any set hours. It's just as, as if an emergency arises and, and I need to get there, then, then we just go. Now despite all the crazy hours, it's a job Thompson loves as it not only allows her to work with animals, but also provides her with daily challenges. I enjoy the people. I enjoy... Um, a, a, a good medicine case is always a challenge to me. Um, I truly don't wake up and say I've got to go to work tomorrow, today. Um, goodness, it's, it's something I really like to do. I get up and I'm excited to go and, and uh, no day is the same and, and just, just that's probably the best, this best part of my, my day every day. Because of that passion, Thompson was recently awarded an Excellence in Ag Award from the Georgia Farm Bureau which not only recognized her good work on the farm, but in the community as well. The, the local school, elementary school here, we do a lot of ag literacy, farm day, uh, mobile classroom dairy with them. Um, the kids love it, the teachers love it. Um, and so it, it's just a good feeling seeing kids get interested in, in agriculture um, because a lot of schools and a lot of kids aren't growing up on farms anymore these days. Reporting from Barnesville, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Damon, thank you very much. Meantime, as the cooler weather of fall approaches, many farm markets in South Georgia closed down for the season. But this year, one popular family farm market in Macon County is extending their season. The Monitor's Mark Wildman traveled to Montezuma to see how the Brown family is gearing up so consumers can keep enjoying fresh Georgia-grown products late in the year. For over 30 years, the Brown family has been running a farm market in Macon County just outside of Montezuma. Consumers drive for miles and miles down Highway 49 to gather fresh produce and enjoy the scenery. And this year they get to sit on the benches a little longer. 
because the market is staying open later in the season this year. And we're going to carry the pumpkins, apples, and all of the fall vegetables that we normally have. And uh, we're going to stay here through November. We'll also have some baked products and some things that we're doing in the kitchen. As the summer produce vanishes from the shelves, they are replaced with many other Georgia-grown products. So we always got the ice cream. We've got the peach ice cream right on and our fresh churned butter pecan too. We grow 90% of what we have on our own farm, the tomatoes, squash, peaches, watermelons, uh, you name it, we got it. But, uh, and then the rest of it, we do have to buy some stuff off the farm, and it's all, but it's all Georgia grown right now. The Brown family enjoys running the market, and as travelers stop by, they get to talk with Howard and get to learn about farming right from the farmer himself. And they get to hear what this market is famous for in the summer. Alberta peaches. That's what made our names Alberta peaches and peach ice cream. Uh, but now, since we've extended the season, of course, the Albertas are gone. So we're trying to put some apples in, and we still have our Xenia patch for the ladies to come down and cut flowers, or the men, uh, to cut flowers. You know, we just, we just have a good atmosphere, good service, good product, and we want to get that to the people. Hay bales are being unloaded, the pumpkins are being labeled, and the fresh Georgia apples await the consumers this fall and what hopes to be a very fun season for those who pass by the market. We got goats for the kids and we have food for them to, to go feed the goats. Uh, we can, uh, we got a pumpkin patch. Uh, we've got, we're gonna have a hay ride. We're gonna have a little corn, uh, find the ball in the corn game that we kind of invented ourselves. Give away a few prizes to the kids and just a nice family atmosphere is what we're trying to promote. This is a family operation and it is very, important. My dad started this thing in 1966. Uh, he died about two years ago and my sister and I have, are carrying it on and uh, we we're, want to keep that legacy for our family and it's extremely important to us. So as you travel the highways of South Georgia this fall, make sure you plan a stop at the William L. Brown Farm Market and enjoy fresh Georgia products during the cooler time of the year. It's in the fall and that's just so unusual for us. A lot of people are having to reset their, the clocks in their head because we're, they think we're closed, but we are not closed. We're here. In Macon County, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Mark, thanks so much. When we come back, joining us in studio will be a nutrition expert with news and details on how dairy can prevent the onset of Alzheimer's. Some important information you need to know if you or a loved one is showing early signs of the disease. That's next. My name is Kayla Allward. I won the Southeastern Student Employee of the Year Award. I'm currently a senior majoring in animal science and dairy science at the University of Georgia. And I also work on the University of Georgia teaching dairy as the calf manager. So some of the daily duties I do are just making sure that the calves are healthy and happy. And for that, I have to check on the calves every day. I walk the pastures and look at them individually, make sure that they're healthy, doing okay. If anything's wrong with them, make sure I can treat them accordingly and work with the managers to figure out what's going on. Last fall winter time we had um, some very we had a very detrimental effect on the herd. We had some pathogens get onto the farm that were making the calves sick and for a few weeks we were running tests trying to figure out what it was after round-the-clock care um, coming out and checking on them first thing in the morning, middle of the night if need be, making, giving them electrolytes, giving them treatments to make sure that they were going to make it through. We didn't lose a single calf um, thanks to the hard work of several calf feeders and the managers, but I worked a lot with that to make sure that the calves were healthy. Worked very closely with the veterinarians to develop a plan of action as well as new biosecurity protocols to make sure that it would never happen again. I grew up with my parents in upstate New York and my dad had a small farming type area, but we didn't actually have a farm. I grew up around horses and hadn't had any interaction with dairy cows until I came here to the University of Georgia and got a job at the dairy my freshman year. They are just sweet, gentle animals. People don't realize that they have so much personality. They're like big dogs. They just want to be pet and loved on, and they're such gentle creatures to work with. 
After I graduate in May, I will be attending UGA again for my master's degree. I'm going to be majoring or I guess doing my master's in dairy reproductive physiology. So I'll be here for another two years. After that, I hope to go on to get a PhD and then enter the university system again and hopefully become a teacher for dairy science. Agriculture is so rewarding. If you think about it, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are today without agriculture. It puts the food on your plate every day and it puts the clothes on your back. So agriculture is such a rewarding job field to be in and it's so there's so many opportunities for jobs in it. Working with animals, whether it's dairy cows, beef cows or pigs or whatever you like, there's so many opportunities and doing that side of things as well as growing crops. I, I feel like there's something that everyone can love. All right, welcome back to the Georgia Farm Monitor. True or false, among adults 50 and older, staying mentally sharp outranks physical health and social security as the top priority and concern in the U.S. Well, according to the Center for Brain Health, the answer is true. And one of the ways in which we can stay mentally sharp and prevent cognitive decline in Alzheimer's is by consuming milk on a regular basis. And joining us now to talk more about that is Mary Martin Nordness, who is the Director of Nutrition Affairs for the Southeast Dairy Association. Mary, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Alzheimer's, of course, dementia, you and I talked about this earlier, a subject very near and dear to my heart. My mother-in-law currently going through it. Uh, she is fighting it right now. Not sure if she drank milk in her younger years, but what's amazing is the research shows that people who do drink milk, um, it actually, it's not, it's not only for your bones, it's not only for your muscles, but it's for your brain as well. And the research shows that drinking milk can actually slow down the onset, onset of Alzheimer's. Talk about this and how it works. We have to remember that your brain is a muscle. Mm -hmm. And we know through sports nutrition that vitamins, minerals, and protein are what muscles crave. So right. it makes sense that your brain needs that also. There's a great research article in The Lancet, which is a British medical journal, mm -hmm. that kind of pointed out some healthy steps that you can take. So I thought that I would share that with you today. Sure, okay. Now, what about for the people who are watching this and, and they're saying to themselves, okay, great, you know, milk, but I'm lactose intolerant. Are there other things that they can do? Absolutely. So vitamin D, uh, in this study, it pointed out that vitamin D, low levels of vitamin D, mm -hmm. have been associated with a higher level of Alzheimer's. So vitamin D is found in milk, but it's also found in the sun. So getting out in the sun, being active in the sun. If you're lactose intolerant, read your label, look in the dairy case. Uh, all dairy foods, like milk, mm -hmm. are fortified with vitamin D. Just be sure and reach the brand that's lactose-free. And you have your little display out here. Uh, I'm assuming these are other foods that actually help boost brain power. Talk about that. Most recent dietary guidelines talks to us about eating patterns. Mm -hmm. They recommend the eating pattern of the Mediterranean diet. Okay. So that's the Greek way of eating. Lots of It's a plant-based diet, lots of fish lots of healthy olive oil. Okay. Now, olive oil has been found to help in the brain structure in keeping that formation tight. Mm -hmm. So we need to be using more healthy fats like olive oil and eating more fish. Okay, and now uh, as far as you know, some of the other things that we can do, um, you mentioned, what about exercise? I mean, do they talk about exercise as well? You talked about getting outside and walking. Ex exercise you is very important. Um, also, when you, uh, another food is walnuts. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at a little walnut, it even looks like a little brain. See how it looks like a little brain? It does look like a brain. So uh, again, omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin E is important and it's found to us in walnuts. Mm -hmm. And then the last you can do is play, play games like Sudoku, word searches, um, crossword puzzles, anything that's going to stretch and make your mind think. Very important. And not to mention exercise and sleep. Absolutely. And we all love playing games anyway. So, uh, and especially now, you, you can find stuff like this on your iPad, on your phone. You just don't have to resort to books as, uh, as well. Uh, but again, you know, a very, very difficult subject for some to talk about, but it is something that we have to talk about. Uh, I know there has been some research out there that now suggests we may have found uh, you know, maybe a link to Alzheimer's, how to, you know, how to... Uh, Exciting research, and with more baby boomers getting to be 65 every day, everybody's interested in how do I preserve my brain. Right, and final question, where can people find more information on this? For more information, look for us on the website southeastdairy.org or follow us on Twitter 
at the Dairy RD. All right. Well, Mary, thank you so much for coming in. Thank we appreciate you. your time. Again, very, very interesting and uh, a subject to discuss and then lots of things that we can do as well. Kenny, we'll go ahead and send it back to you. All right, Ray, when we come back, a day in the life of Georgia Farm Bureau President Gerald Long. Plus... Hey everybody, Ranger Nick, coming up next, I'm going to tell you about a tiny tyrant of an insect that's impacting ash trees all over the southeast and what you can do about it. Coming up. Tee it up and swing away. A warm fall day is a great time for the Battleground Academy golf team to get in a little practice. And what a great facility for these youngsters to learn the game. The Little Course in Franklin, adjacent to the famed Vanderbilt Legends course. Here you can come play for a few dollars. Superintendent Joe Kennedy and the Little Course recently hosted the UT Turf and Ornamental Field Day. One of the reasons the Little Course is here is to exactly do this, uh, to show turf varieties and research. Hundreds of golf course superintendents and athletic field managers came here to learn about weed control, turf varieties, and earn recertification credits. I'm, I'm excited this year. I'm going to talk about different varieties of Bermuda grass and some zoysia grass for golf course fairways, rough heights, and, and putting greens. We're approaching a critical time for golf course superintendents, fall and winter. That's when they have to prepare for possible cold weather, snow and ice, and how that impacts fairways and especially the greens. Well, we're prepping the grasses right now for next year, putting them to bed, fully fed, build, build some carbohydrates so they'll survive next summer. The goal for a superintendent is to have high quality, consistent fairways and greens so that you can play the ball as it lies. That way a good shot like this short iron is rewarded, while a poor shot is a penalty. Turf specialists with UT's Institute of Agriculture work with superintendents around the state and around the world for that matter to give them information to maintain and improve golf courses. Well, we do, we work in concert with golf course superintendents as a resource. So when they, when they will have a problem, whether it's a, a weed management problem or a disease management problem or any sort of agronomic problem related to their golf course, uh, it, you know, there's a relationship where they can reach out to UT. The leaves of autumn are sprinkled across the little course, a signal that we'll be putting up the sticks soon. But before the cold gets here, there's still plenty of great golf to be played. And with the right preparation and work, superintendents and UT turf specialists make sure things roll smoothly. This is Charles Denny reporting. All right, thank you, Charles. Well, one thing about being president of Georgia Farm Bureau, you rack up a lot of travel miles. Case in point, President Long, who spent the day recently touring a number of North Georgia apple orchards, including the one you see here, RNA orchards in LJ. From there, it was off to the Red Apple Barn, with the day concluding later that night at the District 1 meeting in Gordon County. A busy day indeed, but something President Long says is part of the job. Well, you know, it was amazing. We went to five or six different apple houses or uh, facilities. You know, each one of them was unique in their own way. But it's amazing how they have had to adapt through the years to add value to their products or offer their farm. And I want to commend them for being able to do that. Well, finally today, if you're a regular to the show, then you already know that no river, no forest, and no bug is too tough to tame for Ranger Nick. Yeah, that's right. And recently, Nick and myself hiked a mile or two down the Confluence Trail just outside of Atlanta to investigate a problem that's really been bugging him. All right, so I know you're wondering, I've been teasing you about this tiny insect and the influence that it can have over these trees, these ash trees around the country. I'm joined by a good friend, Dr. Dave Coyle, who's with the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Georgia and also the Southern Region Extension Forestry Group. And Dr. Coyle, so this bug, what is this insect and why should our friends at home care? Well, Nick, this insect is a little tiny green beetle that comes from Asia and it, we first found it in North America in 2002. We think it's been here probably a few years before that. So it's probably been in the country 20 years. Okay. And this little insect attacks ash trees and ash trees only, 
but attacks until recently have been completely fatal. And they're only not fatal now because we know how to treat it a little bit better. And that's some of the things that you do with the University of Georgia is treating those insects. Now, so an ash tree, how do I even know I'm, I'm looking at an ash tree if I'm sitting at home and I think I might have one on my property? What am I looking for? Well, ash trees have a few different characteristics, and we've got one right here. The first thing we can look at is branches are opposite. They come off exactly on either side of the main branch. You've okay. got a branch here and a branch here. Okay. And then on that branch, ash has what we call uh, leaflets on the leaves. So this whole thing is a leaf. But each of these little units is a, called a leaflet. And ash has between set five and 11 leaflets uh, on each leaf. And so these two characteristics make an ash tree. It's also got bark that mm -hmm. uh, the bark is really pressed together. It almost looks like you took an accordion and pressed it together. Really tight bark crevices there. That's another good way to tell you've got an ash tree. That's excellent. And I've heard that with ash trees and maple trees and dogwoods, they've all got that opposite branching. So knowing about the leaf scar and the five to seven to 11 leaves and also that bark, that's great. Let's talk about how you know if your ash tree is infected by these insects. All right, so Dave showed us a green ash tree that had a little less damage to it, kind of starting with the emerald ash borer. And Dave, we're standing with a tree now that looks like it's got a little bit more damage. Talk to us about some of the things that are happening with this tree. Well, Nick, you can see this tree is completely snapped off, and that's one of the problems with ash is it gets brittle when it dies. So okay. when it dies, it becomes a hazard tree. Okay. But as you look underneath here where this bark is peeled off, you can see all these galleries where these emerald ash borer larvae have eaten and they've wound their way through and if you look really closely you can even see where they start really small and the gallery gets larger as that little beetle larva grows up and once it gets uh, to a certain size it goes through a pupil stage and then it will come out you'll see those d-shaped exit holes it'll come out of that tree and it'll be one of these nice green beetles they're about the about a half inch long or so and this is what the emerald ash borer looks like this is what causes all this damage. It's incredible, the, the beauty really of this tree, to see those galleries start off smaller as that little larvae is growing and growing, then popping back out of that tree with that D-shaped hole, it's incredible. And I think the folks at home can all look for this kind of stuff on their property and know this is what's going on. Thanks, Dave, interesting. Well, what a day. We've seen light damage on ash trees. We've seen heavier damage on ash trees. And I want you all to know we haven't been out in the middle of nowhere. We've been in a woodlot just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And one of the things I want to talk to you about is so what can you do at home? So you see an ash tree that's got some problems. What can you do? Well, you all know me and I always wear my Ranger Nick uniform in Georgia Extension and your local Extension office is a first place to go for answers about questions you have regarding those trees. Have an agent come out and help you is my tree tree damage, they can help you with that. Another thing that you can do is work with local stakeholders, and I'm joined by a couple of them today. Kimberly Eastep with the Southport Conservancy is here, as well as Brian and Kevin with Trees Atlanta. These are folks that can help us, and Kimberly, what are some other things that we can do? We say extension, what are some other things to help these green ash trees? Well, while we've been working to restore the habitats along the creek bank, we've really put an emphasis on a diversity of trees so that when the ash trees go down, it won't be an entire habitat that's lost. Excellent. But when the trees do fall, they're going to provide really important habitat for native species. Excellent. And y'all know I'm a big fan of coarse woody debris and those snags that are created by those trees. Great stuff, Kimberly. You know, another thing that you can do, very, very simple is when you're going camping this fall, don't move that firewood. Don't take it over a county line. Those little emerald ash borers get in there and you're moving them all over the place. So something to keep in mind. Well, y'all, you know me. Thank you all so much for spending another little bit of time with me. I got to thank Dr. Dave Coyle, spending some time riding together with me over here to Atlanta. We had a blast today. Go on Facebook. You know the deal. Go on there, check out the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page. And while you're there, slide on over to the Ranger Nick Facebook page. We have getting just a blast talking with you and I appreciate y'all doing that. So for the Farm Monitor, I'm Ranger Nick, reminding you as always that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass that stuff on. Y'all, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you right back here again next month. See ya. <laughs> Nick, great job as always. That's gonna do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Just a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm, be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and here on the Farm Monitor Show. Take care, we'll see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a great week.